to the World War II newspaper channel where we read the Chicago Tribune one day at a time, going through World War II as it happened through the eyes of those who lived it. If you enjoy content like this, please subscribe to this channel and click on the bell icon to get notifications when a new upload is going to premiere. And also, if you want to hear the actual newsmakers, go check out my other channel, the companion channel to this one, the World War II Old Time Radio channel. There we have vintage broadcasts, including newscasts, speeches, old movies, and music. And subscribe to that channel and click on the bell icon. Now for the newspaper. News as read from the Chicago Tribune for Sunday, January 26th, 1941. Henry Chap reporting. The weather today. The sun rose at 7.08 a.m. It set at 4.57 p.m. For Chicago and vicinity, light to occasionally moderate snow and slightly colder on Sunday. Monday, partly cloudy to cloudy, occasional light snow in the morning, slowly rising temperature in the afternoon. Moderate to occasionally fresh north to northeast winds on Sunday. The low temperature, 25 degrees. The high temperature, 33 Today's headline, rioting reported in Italy. Belgrade, Yugoslavia, January 25th. Three high-ranking Italian army officers have been killed in the last 24 hours in street rioting in Milan and other cities in northern Italy, according to reports tonight in diplomatic sources here. German soldiers were said to be patrolling Milan streets and using force of arms in an effort to suppress the demonstrations and street fighting which were described in one report as widespread and serious. The report identified the three officers reported slain as generals. Late information from a reliable Belgrade diplomatic source classified the rioting as similar to the Romanian fighting in that many elements of fascist and non-fascist Italian army and civilians and German army units were said to be participating. The death toll was rising rapidly and there were hundreds of wounded, it was said. The three Italian officers reported slain were shot by German soldiers, according to reports here. German troops, officers, and agents of the Gestapo, which is the German secret police, were reported to have seized control of all major buildings, including the post office, telephone, and telegraph buildings in Milan and other cities of northern industrial Italy. German sentries have been posted about important factories, uh, the report said. New York, January 25th. Winston Burdett, CBS correspondent in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, cabled tonight that reports from Italy said there were hundreds of wounded in street rioting, which was declared to be raging in Milan, Turin, and smaller cities in the Italian Po Valley. Burdett's information was cabled to New York and broadcast from here. Three Italian generals assertedly killed in the fighting, Burdett reported, were said to have been slain by German troops, which were believed to be stationed in Milan. The information reaching Belgrade, Burdett said, indicated that German forces were taking a principal part in fighting the disorders. It was not clear, Burdett said, whether the Italian troops which reportedly participated in the fighting were on the side of the regime or the insurgents or both. German troops, according to Burdett's information, also have been given control of all communications on the Italian island of Sicily and in southern Italy in the southern Italian region of Brindisi. About three hours after Burdett's report, the Associated Press in New York had not received any information on the reports of rioting from its correspondents in heavily censored Italy or in neighboring countries. The British Broadcasting Corporation, in a broadcast pick up, picked up in New York, said Marshal Pietro Bad Padoglio, who recently resigned as commander-in-chief of the Italian army, had been placed under house arrest in Italy. Another correspondent for CBS, Harry W. Flannery in Berlin, reported in a broadcast that endless trains with units of the German Air Force have been go going over the Brenner Pass into Italy, carrying materials for airfields, signal facilities, and ammunition supplies. Bucharest, Romania, January 25th. 
General Ion Antonescu, Romania's victorious dictator, offered the leaders of the Iron Guard Rebellion today the bleak alternative of suicide or mass punishment at the hands of the state. Their chief, Vice Premier Hori Asima, was reported variously as under arrest or in, or in flight across Russia, but he and his associates were summoned by the Premier to this strange self-judgment. You rebels, if you are true Iron Guardists, punish yourselves with true legionary punishment, and that by tradition is suicide, or otherwise you may be sure that I shall apply mass punishment myself. It was first understood in Bucharest that Sima had been taken into custody. The subsequent suggestion that he might have found refuge in Russia was interesting in, the, in light of Antonescu's earlier assertion that holdout rebels had been under communist influence. General Antonescu conferred with the German minister Baron Manfred von Killinger and put every dock airport and railroad depot under military control. All save international railroad traffic was halted, a 10 p.m. curfew was imposed, and soldiers were ordered to shoot any person failing to halt when challenged. Long lines of Jews filed all day into morgues to identify relatives killed in the rebellion. Jewish quarters have been sacked, Jewish homes soaked in oil and set afire, and synagogues pillaged, wrecked, and burned. In one Jewish home, four and one-half million lay were stolen. Soldiers in mopping up discovered vast quantities of money, furs, clothing, and furniture that had been looted from homes and shops by the rebels. General Antonescu, still at the head of the state after four days of terror, announced he was forming a new political party that would include Iron Guardsmen who had remained loyal to him and would promote the common spirit with Germany and Italy. The new government is expected to be largely military. Julius Manny, Manny knew peasant leader said he would support plans for the new government. It will be the, f be the first he has fully supported since 1930. Bucharest, Romania, January 25th. Two German officers billeted in the former home of Aristide Blank, once a millionaire Jewish banker, got little sleep for several days of the Iron Guard Rebellion. They were awakened repeatedly by Iron Guardists searching for the banker who had fled. Finally, they put this sign on the door. This house is inhabited only by German officers. They were not bothered anymore. Belgrade, Yugoslavia, January 25th. Belgrade newspapers reported today that an attempt had been made on the life of General Ion Antonescu, Romanian premier on January 21st, by a man wearing the uniform of a porter of the Romanian Foreign Office. They said General Antonescu notified the man fumbling for a revolver and dodged into the bathroom of his home. Bodyguards arrested the, the visitor. Reports reaching Belgrade said that at least 2,000 were dead in the rebellion in Bucharest alone. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Neville Butler, newly appointed minister from Britain, said today that the Libyan campaign, including the capture of Bardia and 80,000 Italian prisoners, cost the Australians who bore the brunt of the attack 31 officers and 265 enlisted men, of whom no more than 17 were actually killed or died of wounds. Butler made the statement in a message to the National Conference for Palestine, which opened here. Cairo, Egypt, January 25th. British armored cars having fallen upon and broken an Italian tank column were reported tonight to have reached Derna, Libya, 175 miles beyond the Egyptian frontier under circumstances suggesting that it had been abandoned by the fascists. During the day, the British met no resistance so far as could be learned. The Italian tanks were dispersed yesterday. While troops and guns were being advanced along the coast road west of Torbrook as fast as trucks could carry them, armored cars and light mechanized units swept past Martuba Airdrome, which the, which the Italians had occupied only three nights ago. Beyond stating that operating, operations were proceeding satisfactorily, the British command gave little information of what had happened at Derna, but the fact that RAF reconnaissance planes reported spotting eight Italian planes burning on the landing ground, there was, consider, considered, uh, this, there was considered significant. 
It appeared that the Italians had fired the planes before retreating. By reaching Derna, which has a population of about 11,000, the British were about halfway to Benghazi. Military sources indicated there might be small pockets of Italians between Torbruk and Derna, which the advanced mechanized elements had passed, leaving the infantry to mop up. Derna once was captured by American Marines, landing an army of Greek and Arab mercenaries. In 1805, President Thomas Jefferson decided to put a stop to the Barbary pirates for depredations against American shipping in the Mediterranean. Under command of Captain William Eaton, 10 American Marines and 450 volunteers stormed and took the town, the first important blow in the war which broke the power of the Barbary chieftains. British troops advancing into Italian Eritrea from the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan were reported more than 100 miles inside the East African colony yesterday, approximately halfway to the Red Sea port of Massawa. In the southwest sector of this East African offensive, the British were pushing into Ethiopia opposite Galabad. Within Ethiopia, where the deposed Emperor Haile Selassie is reported rallying the natives in an effort to regain his conquered land from the Italians, the fascists were said to have abandoned several additional posts because of further British pressure and that, rebelling, and that of rebelling patriots. Across the frontier of Kenya, Italian detachments were reported being driven back by South African forces now operating well across into enemy territory. The RAF was strongly supporting these various offensives. Italian planes on a field at Magrum, south of Benghazi, were damaged, a communique reported, and in Eritrea, hits were scored on rail lines in Bishia, Agordat, and Karen. Italian camps, planes, and mortar transport were also reported bombed. Rome, January 25th. The Italian High Command acknowledged the fall of Torbrook today and announced that fascist losses in the final assault were heavy. The Daily War Bulletin said that the last detachments, which had been offering desperate resistance to enemy attacks in the western sector of Torbrook, were overcome during yesterday. Berlin, January 25th. The German warplanes, which have gone to the aid of Italy in the Mediterranean basin, were credited by informed German sources today with damage to two British battleships and a cruiser in a successful attack on a convoy west of Crete. The High Command said merely that several bomb hits of heavy and medium caliber on three heavy English naval units were clearly observed, but other sources were more specific. They said a heavy bomb struck the stern of one battleship, that two bombs damaged the bow and starboard of another battleship, and that a heavy cruiser was also struck. London, January 25th. Despite the successes in Africa, British military experts are guarding against overenthusiasm because of the appearance of the German Air Force in the Mediterranean area. The concentration of German air attacks on Malta is considered a prelude to what is believed will be a decisive test of air and sea power, Malta is expected to face the fiercest attacks in its stormy history. This island is some 400 miles from the nearest British sea base, and the German power to deliver air attacks from neighboring land bases must be encountered by the air reinforcements which the British fleet is able to supply. It would be extremely dangerous for powerful naval units to participate in the defense of Malta if the mastery of the air were lost. Well-informed persons have been puzzled at the failure of the fascists to press attacks on Malta, which is regarded as indispensable for successful Italian conduct of the war in Libya. The admission by the Italians that their armies in Africa have been practically isolated from Italy proper is said to reveal the great strategic value of Malta. This consideration is believed to be causing the German general staff to regard the island as a prime objective. Athens, January 25th. Greek soldiers captured more than 100 prisoners in successful local actions in Albania and six Italian planes were shot down over the front and during a raid on Salonika, the Greek High Command reported tonight. The Ministry of Home Security said some damage and a few casualties among the civilian population resulted from the raid on Salonika. Petoli, Yugoslavia, January 25th. 
Reports reaching here today said the Italian Air Force was increasing its activity in Albania and a large formation of fascist planes was said to have attacked Greek positions. The main pressure from Italian troops was said to be directed against the Tepelini sector. Violent infantry fighting was reported in one area. Rome, January 25th. Important positions along the Albanian battlefront were reported by the Italian High Command today to have been wrested from the Greeks. Location of the positions was not specified. London, January 26th. A lone air raider dropped two high-explosive bombs on a town on England's west coast last night, the first evening air attack anywhere in Britain after a lull of four nights. There were no serious casualties, it was reported, but some property dam was damaged and a gas main was punctured. Up to midnight, London still was without an alarm, making the capital's sixth raidless night in succession. Some quarters have expressed belief that reforming, that reforming of German air units as well as bad weather had been responsible for the recent lull in Nazi attacks. The Air Ministry communique, however, said that in spite of very bad weather conditions on Friday, aircraft of the British Coastal Command bombed a submarine base in Lorient, France, without loss of a plane. Berlin, January 25th. The last warning to the population of Amsterdam was a headline in the Deutsche Zeitung in den Nederland, the official German organ in Holland. In this warning, the mayor appealed to the citizenry to do their best to prevent acts of sabotage. He stated that so far no sabotage has been committed in Amsterdam, but that in a city of 800,000 inhabitants such actions may occur. He held it must not be allowed that the whole town must be made to suffer for the actions for of a few. The Zetong pointed out that a fine of 60,000 florins, the florin or gilder, not quoted in foreign exchange markets, was worth about 53 cents before the war, was imposed on circles in The Hague, though they did not participate actively in the outrage for which the city is being punished. The, Zet the Deutsche Zetung charged that the last weeks and months showed that the Dutch population is inclined to fall for rumors and to believe in leaflets, le leaflets which are being spread. But the sentences imposed by the German courts showed that the German authorities struck fast. The fine imposed on the Hague circles because wires belonging to the German army were cut was said to prove that the German authorities are determined to uproot this evil by punishing the instigators. Berlin, January 25th. DNB, official German news agency, reported tonight that a long-range German bomber had sunk a 4,000-ton British merchant ship 220 miles west of Ireland. New York, January 25th. Welded plates, instead of the conventional riveting, form part of the speed secret of England's mighty new battleship King George V. Naval experts believe today on the basis of photographs taken off Annapolis. The swift, rugged monster, which can do a knot for each thousand of her 35,000 tons, outspeeding even such liners as the Bremen and Europa, apparently is streamlined by the welding process, the experts said, although they had no opportunity for close inspection. Photographs also indicated to the experts that there are six big guns forward and two and four gun turrets and one four gun turret aft. It had been believed that the major cannon, which, which would be evenly divided in two gun turrets, the guns are 14 inches of a new type said to have greater range than previous 15 inches. They fire 1,400 pound shells. The ship's armament also includes 16 5.25 inch guns according to the photographs. The battleship seems to have an unusually low freeboard for such a large vessel riding low in the water to make it a more difficult target for aerial attack. Reports that the ship would have a slanting deck as bomb protection do not appear to be borne out by the pictures. The battleship is reported to have cost $28 million or 60% less than a United States ship of the same category. The reason for this wide difference is reported to be wage standards. Annapolis, Maryland, January 25th. The United States Naval Academy played host to some officers, midshipmen, and enlisted men of the British battleship King George V before its sail today, ending a 21-hour visit to Annapolis. 
In return, Lieutenant Commander Chester Wood, an aide to the Academy Superintendent, and several other Academy officers were taken aboard the new 35,000-ton warship, one of the most powerful in the British Navy, for an inspection visit. The inter-visits were disclosed by Navy officials after the battleship, which brought Lord Halifax, new ambassador to the United States, lifted anchor shortly before noon and sailed down the misty Chesapeake Bay, its destination a secret. It was disclosed also that three American naval off officials also had a chance to inspect the dreadnought. Those who went over the ship last night uh, were Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox, Admiral Harold R. Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, and Captain Daniel J. Callaghan, the President's Naval Aide. New York, January 25th. Germany has more oil and gasoline on hand today after 16 months of war than when the struggle began, but Italy is short of both these essential combatant materials oil experts here believe. Both nations before the war depended on other countries for supplies of these basic needs of mechanized conflict. Germany, the oil men estimated, has 49 million barrels of motor fuel in reserve now, compared with 40 million when the Polish campaign started in September 1939. The present stores are sufficient, as it is estimated, to permit Germany to carry on six months of the intense activity displayed in the one-month blitzkrieg against France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Great Britain, controlling the seas with the United States, the world's chief producer, has an abund abundance of oil. Many experts from time to time have suggested that a lack of petroleum might strangle the war efforts of Germany and Italy. This view may be correct, the oilmen said, in the case of Italy. They said it might well be that a shortage of oil and gasoline has kept the Italian Navy in harbor and the vaunted Italian Air Force of 6,000 planes mainly on the ground. Italy's main controlled source of oil has been Albania, but the Greeks and the British Royal Air Force have just about eliminated that supply. Italy is not believed to have built up much of a reserve before the war, expending great quantities of oil con uh, consecutively in the Ethiopian and Spanish campaigns. Now Italy's sole dependable route of oil supplies is by railroad across the Alps, and Hitler is not believed disposed to export much of the precious, precious, excuse me, precious fluid. On the other hand, one source asserted that Germany today actually is exporting lubricating oil. The exports are relatively small, it is true, but the fact is sufficient to indicate that the German war machine is not handicapped by the lack of lubricants. The lubricating oil, a synthetic product, probably made at Politz, a suburb of Stettin, is being sent to Hungary in exchange for Kassenhead gasoline, a highly volatile product of natural petroleum. Using her vast coal resources as well as the coal mines of conquered Poland and France, Germany is producing artificial gasoline at a rate estimated to be 100,000 barrels a day. This production takes place at plants located in Politz, Madensburg, and Zietz. An entirely new development in the German oil industry is a high-pressure production within Germany itself of natural petroleum. <coughs> The Reich has old fields at Nienhagen and Wietz. These fields produced 3,115,000 barrels in 1936, and production there is believed to have been stepped up. In addition, new fields have gone into full production near Hamburg and at Sisterdorf, northeast of Vienna. These fields combined, it was suggested, may have an output of around 9 million barrels a year. Germany failed to capture Poland's oil fields due to the fact that the Russian army got there first, but Germany is reported acquiring virtually the whole output of the Polish wells, a matter of 3 million barrels a year. The oil from Poland appears to be all the petroleum that Russia is letting Germany have despite a trade agreement under which last year the Russians agreed to sell the Nazis 6 million barrels. By occupying Romania, Hitler was assured of the total production of that petroleum-rich nation. The Romanians, it was reported, are not cooperating fully and are bringing up only 100,000 barrels a day, compared with their former production of 120,000 to 130,000 daily. It was suggested that the German supply in the seven months which have elapsed since the fall of France may have run 3 million barrels a month in excess of needs. 
Shortly after France fell, it was estimated that the German reserve of motor fuel plus captured stocks totaled 28 million barrels. Bangkok, Thailand, January 25th. Thai heavy artillery began today a fierce bombardment of the French Indochina Fortress and Highway Junction at Shishabsan, the Thai High Command announced. Both the northeastern and eastern Thai armies were reported continuing advances into Indochina. French positions were said to have suffered heavy damage in exchanges of gunfire across the Mekong River border. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Despite the fact that surprisingly little damage has been done to British munitions protection so far in the European war, a start has been made on the transfer of British industries to Canada, Clarence D. Howe, Canadian Munitions Minister, revealed today. Howe returned yesterday from England with Ambassador Viscount Halifax on the new British battleship King George V. On his trip to England, the vessel on which he was traveling was torpedoed. House said that several Eng- English manufacturers also have been bombed out of business, will re-establish in Canada. Others, he said, plan to establish branches in Canada. London, January 25th. Shipping Minister Ronald Cross in, transatlantic bro- in a transatlantic broadcast to the United States declared tonight that Britain can beat the U-boat threat, but we must have your industrial support. Cross, whose job it is to assure British ships for her urgency needed supplies, dwelt at length on Britain's reliance on seaborne commerce for survival and her fight to keep the sea lanes open and filled with her ships. We face serious danger, Cross declared. Ever since the fall of France, our shipping losses have been heavy and at the present rate of sinkings, the day might come when our power to import would not equal our military needs. We are putting out all our energy using every resource to meet this threat, for if the output of your factories could not reach these shores, our plans to defeat Hitlerism must yield to a mere passive defense. The war might drag on for, for, a, for long years before we could wear down the enemy's spirit, so it is vital to maintain our shipping. British shipyards are working at full strength to replace losses of cargo ships and reduce them by augmenting warships to protect protect convoys but the need for ships exceeds the unaided capacity of our yards new york january 25th when the united states cruiser louisville slipped into her anchorage at new york navy yard brooklyn shortly after noon thursday she had 250 million dollars in foreign gold stored in her holds it was revealed today Moreover, the Louisville was fresh from keeping company with the HMS King George V on a part of her historic voyage bearing Lord Halifax to his new post as ambassador. The Louisville, so the story goes, accidentally met the King George V just outside the 300-mile neutrality zone, and it happened that the two ships were going in the same direction. So they stayed together until they were off the Virginia Capes, where the cruiser turned north to deliver her gold. Berlin, January 25th. The arrival in the United States of Lord Halifax, Britain's new ambassador, got scant notice in most of the German press today, but the Borisin Zetun gave it a column-headed journey accompanied by heart palp- palpitation. It snickered at a nation which claims to rule the seas, having to use a powerful battleship to get one man across the Atlantic. Halifax lost no time to impress on the American public the urgent need for American help for England, the newspaper said. Shortly after Roosevelt met him at the Annapolis dock, he declared, with the still unbroken arrogance of an English aristocrat toward the American people who once were colonists of the British, that he would inform the Americans from time to time in what manner they can help. England resembles a mortally wounded man who, with his last strength, flees into the arms of a Samaritan who is able to speak comforting words and give a couple of injections, producing dreams, but who lacks the right medicines. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Viscount Halifax, new British ambassador to the United States, had his first conference with Secretary of State Cordell Hull today after and afterward announced we see things very much alike. 
The new ambassador, who was paying his first formal call at the State Department after his precedent-breaking reception yesterday on Chesapeake Bay by President Roosevelt, talked briefly with newspapermen after exchanging views with the State Department head on the internet on international affairs. President Roosevelt's action in coming to meet me upon my arrival on the battleship King George V, Halifax said, will be deeply appreciated in England and throughout the empire where its significance will be understood. Discussing the war, the new ambassador declared that, in his opinion, when history comes to be written, Hitler will have been found to have lost the war in June 1940 when he failed to take advantage of the situation existing after the collapse of France. The Viscount said England when uh, England then was at its weakest and Germany might have been able to cash in if it had acted quickly. The ambassador said he was looking forward to seeing different parts of the United States and to see what you are doing and will be doing, I hope, to aid us. As what he considered the most Im- immediate needs, Halifax said, mobilization of your great industrial strength and translating that into action and supplying us with the ships and supplies we need. It is quite clear, Halifax continued, that Hitler is making a desperate effort to intensify the sea blockade of England. That means a severe strain on our ships, our navy, and our aircraft. Help in meeting that strain is vital, and the quicker you can give it to us, the better. Halifax added that there is no doubt in England that spring will bring a great German attack. We have no illusions about Germany's strength or plans, Halifax said, but we know they will not succeed. Halifax was asked if he brought any special plea from Prime Minister Churchill for American aid. I have been in the war cabinet, he answered, and I think I know what is in the mind of the Prime Minister, and still being a member of the war cabinet, I think I will be able to translate that. There is no doubt that the people of England are in great heart. If the Germans think they are going to upset the British people, they have made a great mistake. Particularly, they did so when they bombed Buckingham Palace. Montreal, Quebec, January 25th. John G. Winnant, prominently mentioned as President Roosevelt's choice as United States Ambassador to Great Britain, declared tonight that Britain and the world's democratic combatants are fighting a system which represents the negation of social justice. Vichy, France, January 25th. Colonel Francois de la Roque, former commander of the fascist Croix de Fieu organization and only yesterday named a member of member of Chief of State Marshal Pétain's advisory council has been placed under house arrest in Paris by the Germans, it was reported tonight. He was said to have been arrested at the demarcation line between occupied and unoccupied territory yesterday en route from the latter zone. The Germans, it was reported, informed him his permit to pass no longer was good and conducted him to his home in Paris, where he was held for death. Disposition of the occupying authorities. Vichy, France, January 25th. General Henry Girard, having reached the age limit, was placed on the retired list by a decree today. He is a prisoner of war in Germany. General Girard was given command of the Second Army when it was cut up on the Meuse last May. In an attempt to rally his forces, General Girard rushed to the fighting line in a tank, it was said, and was captured. Dublin, January 25th. A crisis within a few weeks or a few months, and with it, the greatest danger to the Irish nation was forecast tonight by Shane Lamas, Ireland's Minister of Supplies. Speaking at the annual dinner of the Institute of Journalists, he said Ireland had the right to be neutral and we have the right to expect the belligerents to take to uh, take care and assure that of the thousands of bombs falling from the skies, none fall on our territory. But rights alone, he added, are poor protection for small states when great empires go to war. Ireland was facing the danger of invasion only a few months ago, the minister said, and he asked, is that danger past? I think that the very contrary is the truth. Within a few weeks or a few months, a crisis will come, and with it, the greatest danger to our nation. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Emperor Hirohito of Japan is congratulating President Roosevelt on his inauguration for a third term declared, 
I earnestly wish that the friendly relations between our respective countries may be strengthened during our term of the exalted office. The president replied that he reciprocated the friendly sentiments of the Japanese emperor. The emperor's message was one of many from heads of states addressed to the president and made public today by the State Department. Germany and Italy, Axis partners of Japan, were not among the nations whose leaders sent congratulations. Marshal Felipe Pétain, chief of the French state, sent his warm uh, felicitations and the president rapidly assured the marshal of our sincere good wishes for you and for the French people. Saigon, French Indochina, January 25th. Japan's new role of peacemaker in the Far East as mediator in the Thailand-French Indochina border warfare has created a feeling here that the southward expansion of the Japanese influence in Indochina is likely to be greatly in evidence shortly. Thus far, Japanese activity in this French colony has been principally confined to the northern portion centering in Hanoi, the capital. There are reports now that a Japanese mission is slated to come to this southern port aboard a warship to confer with, the gov- with government representatives concerning Japanese and Indochina problems. Hanoi reports said Japanese transports, which took additional Japanese troops to Haiphong, unloaded men and equipment and departed without taking away any of the Japanese forces, which had been in North Indochina since September. San Francisco, California, January 25th. A $64,000 cargo of scrap iron loaded for shipment to Japan in 1937 and stranded in San Francisco Bay ever since will go into the national defense hopper. It is the cargo of the Quang Yuan freighter which has experienced ship fights, mutiny, seizure, and several new owners in recent years. The Chinese Consul General refused to allow the vessel clearance in 1937, asserted it had been seized from China and was being reclaimed under war conditions. The federal court ruled the ship was properly in Chinese custody, though the cargo certainly belonged to Japan, which had paid for it. The Japanese had little benefit of of the ruling, however, for they could not touch the ship to move it to a pier for unloading, and to unload it at anchor was not regarded as feasible. The United States Supreme Court declined to review the decision. The ship recently was sold by the Chinese to a to the Carpenter Line. The scrap to be unloaded today is to go to the Bethlehem Steel Company, presumably under a settlement with the Japanese. Santiago, Chile, January 25th. Spain does not desire material concessions in the shape of land or riches of any kind in South America, an official statement issued by the Spanish embassy said today. It sought to clarify the recent establishment in Madrid of the Hispanic Council, which some reports said was a cloak for the semi-imperialistic aims of the Franco government. Mexico City, January 25th. General Maximino Avila Camacho, brother of Mexico's president, will go to the United States shortly for treatment at Johns Hopkins Hospital or the Mayo Institute, it was reported today. He will leave after his term as governor of the of Puebla State expires next Friday. His illness has not been diagnosed. New York, January 25th. Guarded by a squad of 20 detectives, Prince Olaf and his consort, Martha of Norway, arrive from Washington by train today for an indefinite stay. They plan to attend services tomorrow at the Norwegian Seamen's Church in Brooklyn and a Norwegian reception at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Lisbon, Portugal, January 25th. Wendell L. Wilkie rested tonight after a round of conferences here preparatory to flying tomorrow to England on the last leg of his journey to London. He arrived here yesterday on the Yankee Clipper. The former Republican presidential candidate conferred for 45 minutes with Prime Minister Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. Los Angeles, California, January 25th. English dispatches today disclosed that five relatives of Cary Grant, film star, were killed when German planes raided Bristol, a port in southwest England. They were buried in the wreckage of their home when a bomb scored a direct hit. Bristol was subjected to severe raids by German bombers on November 27th and December 3rd. London, January 25th. 
Minister of Labor Ernst Bevin today called a conference of employers and workers for Wednesday at which he will outline proposals for a vast reorganization of war production. Men and women engaged in the urgent work of producing aircraft have already been instructed to work tomorrow an hour longer than the regular working day to speed up production. In other factories too, night and day work has been urged. Berlin, January 25th. Confiscation of the properties and assets of Richard Tauber, one of Germany's best-known tenors, was announced today in the official gazette, which said he owed 1 million marks, or about $400,000, in taxes. The announcement also said that Tauber, who is a Jew, is to be arrested if found in Germany. Belgrade, Yugoslavia, January 25th. A drifting mine washed ashore and exploded today at Budva on Yugoslavia's Adriatic coast. A large villa was blown up and nearby dwellings were damaged to the extent of 500,000 dinars, or about $11,750. And now for national news. New York, January 25th. Senator Robert A. Taft, Republican Ohio, said tonight that he regarded any amendment to limit to two years the authority of the administration dictator bill as wholly unimportant. Whatever harm can come of the bill will have come before two years. The truth is that nothing we can do at this moment, no legislation Congress can adopt, will give effective aid to England before 1942. He added an address prepared for a meeting of the New York State Bar Association. I am indeed hopeful that the present setup of the National Defense Commission is making effective progress, although from an organization standpoint, the double-headed control is not sound in theory. The British themselves were at least partly responsible for this because they did not give the orders which would have justified the enlargement of plants. Little Rock, Arkansas, January 25th. More than 1,200 persons living in and around Cato, a small but age-ripened community 15 miles north of here, will be among America's first native war refugees after February 1st. That is the date set by the government as the deadline for families to leave their homes in a 39,500-acre area being leased by the War Department for use as artillery ranges and maneuver grounds in the expansion of Camp Robinson. Their removal will climax a long long controversy featured by mass meetings of farmers protesting the evictions, appealing to Washington, and threats to sit tight until the shells start raining. Well known among this determined latter group is Frankie Dean, former prize fighter and former carnival worker, who has in his front yard a sign reading, Your government stole this home. He has vowed he will not move until the artillery blasts his house loose from its foundations. Not all families living in the area desired for the use of the 35th Division troops have opposed the change. Many already have voluntarily leased their land to the government and have moved. Others capitulated grudgingly, feeling that there was nothing else they could do when the government commands them. The most most pathetic and determined of the lot, however, are those embedded over over being forced to leave their familiar surroundings, their churches, schools, and buried relatives. They resent having their community destroyed and being resettled at distances raging up to 35 miles away. Cato residents have protested that they do not want to return to shell-scarred land, which will have grown up during their absence in Bermuda and permission... Permission sprouts, or I'm sorry, persimmon sprouts. The chief grievance of the farmers has has been over the government contract to lease the land rather than purchase it. Leases are for a single year with an option for five-year renewal and a settlement provision for damage done by shells to houses and, and farm buildings. The farmers contend the government either should buy their land outright or lease it now for five years instead of one year and make a lump sum payment that would enable them to relocate on farms elsewhere. The government lease contract pays a rental of only 7% of the value of the land. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Papers in the files of the United States Civil Service Commission containing data on personnel for filing national defense positions are being abstracted and copied by the thousands by a mysterious group in the Capitol, 
It was reported tonight by the Washington Times-Herald. The documents are the personnel, personal information sheets compiled by the Civil Service Commission in June 1940. Approximately 900,000 government employees were required to fill out the questionnaires with a view to ascertaining their availability for jobs under the defense program. After they are copied, the papers are slipped back into the files by the same agent who obtains them, the newspaper charged. The sheets are copied by approximately 20 clerks in the offices of a firm which bears an ordinary business name. It was charged that at least 15,000 of the papers are away from government files today. They were papers containing the names of employees of the White House, of the War, Navy, State, Treasury, and Interior Departments. The sheets bear not only the names, but the entire background of training experience and present duties of the employees it was charged. New York, January 25th. B.E. Sackett, in charge of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's New York office, said today there had been no wave of organized sabotage against American industry by foreign agents and that investigation had shown that 98% of recent explosions in industrial plants were due to speed up of industry and experience of employees with machines or simply carelessness. Ogdensburg, New York, January 24th. A German pursuit pilot who predicted a knockout blow against England in March and British capitulation by September left for New York City tonight after escaping two days ago from a Canadian prison train. The flyer, Baron Franz von Wera, 26 years old, boarded a train after his relief release on $5,000 bond posted by the German consulate in New York City. He was arrested here last night and waived examination today on a charge of illegal entry. He is scheduled to appear before a federal grand jury in Albany on January 30th. Von Wera said he previously fred, fled from two British prison camps after being forced down in England last September 7th. He entered the United States by crossing the St. Lawrence River in a rowboat, he said, so he could return to Germany in time to join in a knockout blow against England in March. Rudolf Mueller, another German prisoner who escaped in Canada Thursday, was captured by police in Quebec. San Juan, Puerto Rico, January 25th. Eleven men, including members of the Nationalist Party, which calls the United States a foreign invader holding Puerto Rico by military force, were indicted today for failure to register for selective service. St. John's, Newfoundland, January 25th. United States soldiers ferried here from New York to man the still unfinished Newfoundland defense base waited outside this harbor tonight while a storm kept their transport, the Edmund B. Alexander, from berthing. Wind and sea made it too hazardous to guide the 21,329-ton troop ship once the transatlantic liner America through the narrow rock-bound channel into St. John's Harbor. The United States base here, a gift from Britain, will have an airfield, an Army Defense Force site and 160 acre, uh, of 160 acres and a naval area of 22 acres. Detroit, Michigan, January 25th. Visualize a column of motor vehicles of various types placed bumper to bumper or extending from New York to Chicago. Such a column would represent a small part of the defense program that rests with the automobile industry aside from tanks and aircraft. The trucks, ambulances, truck tractors, special passenger cars, and other vehicles the United States Army expects the motor industry to deliver this year would require that much standing room, according to industry statisticians. Even so, they add some of the pygmy or quarter-ton vehicles would have to be put inside the big six-tonners. Delivery of the Army orders for transport vehicles already has begun, but the major part will go out from the factories during the next 10 months. Among the vehicles are about 27,000 motorcycles, 4,500 of the pygmy trucks, 5,900 passenger cars, 3,400 ambulances, 69,000 half-ton trucks, 44,000 one-and-a-half-ton trucks, 58,000 two-and-a-half-ton trucks, 3,800 four-ton trucks, 3,800 six-ton and heavier trucks, and 37,800 two-and-one-half-ton truck tractors, each with one trailer unit. Unique in military service is the quarter-ton midget truck. 
It has a load capacity of only a quarter of a ton, stands slightly more than three feet high, and has an overall length of 81 inches. It has a top speed of 60 miles an hour, obtained from a four-cylinder, 42-horsepower ho motor, capable of carrying three men, an anti-aircraft gun, and light field pieces. It weighs only 1,700 pounds. Special equipment provides six forward and two reverse speeds. Muskogee, Oklahoma, January 25th. A three-judge federal court today ruled out the attempt of Governor Leon C. Phillips of Oklahoma to halt construction of the $54 million Denison Dam. It sustained the motion of the federal government to dismiss his injunction suit. The governor, through counsel in a hearing before the judges in Durant several weeks ago, contended that building the huge dam across the Red River at the Oklahoma-Texas boundary was an invasion of the sovereign rights of his state. Duxbury, Massachusetts, January 25th. Andrew Penanen, 42 years old, who owns a small cranberry bog, received a $1,015.25 check from the government today for complying with the Federal Soil Conservation Program. Overpaid by exactly $1 million because of a Treasury check writer's error, Penanen extracted all the fun he could out of the situation. He walked into Plymouth National Bank, pushed the check in front of teller Walter Roberts, and calmly asked for cash. Roberts blinked and raced, and raced for bank officials. They poured over the check, found it valid, and worried about how to produce a million dollars on demand. Only then did Pannonen admit he was joking. Instead of trying to cash it, he mailed it back to the Treasury to be corrected. Washington, D.C., January 25th. Well-informed Senate sources said today that President Roosevelt had selected Senator James F. Burns of South Carolina to succeed James C. McReynolds, McReynolds as Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Mr. Roosevelt said yesterday he had selected an appointee but added that the name would not be announced for many weeks. McReynolds will retire on February 1st. The chief executive laughed when asked whether the nomination would be delayed until after Congress axed on, acts on his aid to Britain legislation. Burns has been designated one of the floor managers for the bill, and Senate informants said that an announcement of his appointment, to, his appointment to the Supreme Court would be withheld until the measure has been disposed of. Burns was uncommunicative, but reported receptive to a court appointment. New York, January 25th. Gangdom's fear of District Attorney Thomas E. Dewey's was illustrated today by the revelation that Arthur Dutch Schultz Flegenheimer was assassinated because he insisted that Dewey be put out of the way. Instead, however, the czars of New York's underworld foreseeing that Dewey's death would inflame public sentiment and all of us would burn, decreed the death of Schultz. Accordingly, on the night of October 24, 1935, three hired killers walked into a Newark, New Jersey tavern and shot Schultz to death. A suspect held in Brooklyn is expected to be indicted in Newark next week. This is the story that has been given to District Attorney William J. O'Dwyer of Brooklyn by Albert Tannenbaum, who has been one of O'Dwyer's best witnesses against the Brooklyn murder mob that has been dubbed Murder Incorporated because its gunmen placed murder on a business basis and set a fee for each of its executions. A number of its members already have been sentenced to die in the electric chair. And now for local and regional news. The staff of the 33rd Division Illinois National Guard Warrior will confer here tomorrow with Major General Leslie J. McNair, Chief of Staff of the Army's new General Headquarters for the training of the field forces, who will advise them concerning the division's induction into federal service next month. This was announced at Guard Headquarters yesterday. The 33rd Division, one of the 47 Guard units called into service earlier this month, has been awaiting completion of cantonment facilities at Camp Forest, Tennessee. Construction delays there have forced two postponements of the start of training. The effective date for the order calling the division into active service is expected to be announced by General McNair. Guard officials here have been led to believe they will be sworn into service February 24th and will move south about March 15th. 
Reports from headquarters of the 4th Corps area in Atlanta, Georgia, indicate the 33rd will be transferred between March 1st and March 15th. General McNider will fly to Chicago tomorrow morning, accompanied by a staff consisting of Lieutenant Colonels William C. Crane, Farragut F. Hall, Mark W. Clark, Lloyd D. Brown, Jerry V. Matejka, and Major James G. Christensen. He plans to visit Camp Ripley near Little Falls, Minnesota for a similar conference while in the West, and it is possible that he may choose to fly directly there tomorrow, conferring with the staff here on Wednesday. Meanwhile, plans for organization of the Illinois Reserve Militia, which will replace the 33rd Division as a state defense body, were announced yesterday by Major General John V. Clinton, commander of the militia, or Clinton, I'm sorry, Clinton, commander of the militia. Fifty officers of the militia division staff and commanders from throughout the state attended a conference yesterday in the LaSalle Hotel at which General Clinton said that 10,000 men organized into six infantry regiments will be in Chicago and down and downstate will be enlisted. Most of the men will be war veterans, but as many men as possible between the ages of 18 and 35 will be enlisted to provide them with basic training before they are conscripted, the general said. Fighting equipment will include Enfield rifles supplied by the government, shotguns, bayonets, gas guns, gas grenades, and police riot sticks. The militia will use squad cars, eight to each company, equipped with radios and manned by riflemen and gas throwers. Heavy trucks will be provided as troop carriers and may be used tactically as tanks, General Clinton said. Sixteen young women in the Chicago area are being trained in aviation by the government to prepare them for services similar to those of England's women transport pilots, the ATAs or Air Transport Auxiliary. The ATAs fly planes from factories and assembly shops to flying fields used by fighter squadrons. The Chicagoland program was shown yesterday in a survey made at 14 colleges where civilian pilot training courses are being given by the Civil Aeronautics Bureau. Pilot training rules permit only one-tenth of each class to be women, and those now being trained have been selected from hundreds of applicants. Girls selected for training must have sophomore status in college, be between 19 and 26 years old, and must pass a physical examination. The consensus of flying instructors in the colleges is that the young women are excellent aviation students. Several girls were the first to solo and to complete flight training in their classes. One of these, Miss Ilmi Nichols of Central, y- of Central YMCA College, has been recommended by her flight operator, Harold Harbicken, for admittance to the secondary phase of the training program, which includes advanced flying and aerob- uh, acrobatics. Charles E. Cox, acting superintendent of the third region for, civil aeronaut- for the Civil Aeronautic Bureau, said women have been almost completely excluded from advanced training courses because of the heavy military equipment which is used in them. Rantoul, Illinois, January 25th. Due to a mild form of measles, Chanute Field here housing the Air Corps Technical School was under quarantine today as a precautionary measure against the spread of the disease. Less than 75 cases were reported among the nearly 13,000 men. The quarantine was ordered when the disease described as three-day or German measles became evident. Post theaters were closed, all athletic events canceled, and there will be no religious services on Sunday. Offices of the Chicago Committee for Aid to Finland Incorporated, a permanent organization of Americans interested in the rehabilitation of Finland, were opened yesterday at 2.20. 223 West Jackson Street with Arthur Meeker as chairman. Uh, Aid for Finland Incorporated organized at the behest of of, uh, uh, Monsignor George A. D. Krippenberg, I'm sorry, Madam, I'm sorry, Madam George A. D. Krippenberg, wife of the Finnish Minister to England, seeks to raise funds for the still desperate plight of the Finnish people. Committees already have been organized in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. The Chicago chapter of the American Red Cross obtained 139 answers to inquiries about relatives in Europe for residents of the Chicago area during the first two weeks of this month, according to an announcement made yesterday from headquarters. 
The service operates through the International Red Cross Committee in Geneva, Switzerland. Individuals wishing to make use of the service may file inquiries in the chapter office, 616 South Michigan Avenue. The University of Chicago's 80-ton cyclotron, an apparatus that gives such elements as iron, phosphorus, carbon, and chlorine the radioactive properties possessed by radium, has been equipped with a device through which these elements now may be infused with in sufficient volume to satisfy some of the needs of Chicago doctors, dentists, and biochemists. The cyclotron, known as an atom smasher, was completed in the service building on the Midway in 1935 under direction of Professor William D. Harkins of the School of Chemistry since retired. It is now operated under the direction of Professor Samuel K. Allison of the Physics Department. The apparatus has been enlarged from year to year until its cost is now estimated at $100,000. Heretofore, the cyclotron, which has two Conical magnets placed point to point in the shape of a giant hourglass has created artificial radioactivity by whirling millions of deuterons, atoms of heavy of heavy hydrogen, in a circle within a cylindrical chamber at the convergence or waste of the magnets. It has created an amazingly swift whirlpool in the chamber through magnetic force. The pole in in the point. Of one of, them, of one magnet being positive, whereas the pole in the point of the other is negative. A small bombardment chamber now has been attached to the main chamber of the cyclotron in such a manner that millions of de- deuterons are deflected in, into it from the outer rim of the whirlpool. They are hurled against the far or end wall of the smaller rectangular casing. Embedded in this wall is a small open-faced locket, which is removable, containing the element to be infused. The iron or the iron, phosphorus, carbon, or chlorine is placed in the in a container a gram at a time. Uh, the locket may be removed after the element within it has been rendered radioactive, and the element may be transported there into hospitals or doctors' office offices. In a demonstration, a university scientists replaced this locket with a membrane of aluminum one thousandth, thousandth of an inch thick. The clear-cut stream of atoms flowing into the chamber, chamber was visible to the naked eye as it emerged on the outer surface of the membrane and projected itself a bright violet shaft for nearly two feet into the outer air. The stream became visible outside the chamber, it was explained, because ordinary air is highly contaminated in comparison with the near vacuum on the inside of the cyclotron's chambers. William E. Boynton, a contractor at 1632 West 75th Place, who holds the bulk of $850,000 contracts, let by the former Democratic administration for repair of seven state institutions, said yesterday he had no intention of abandoning the jobs, despite an order issued Friday by Governor Green that the work be stopped. The governor directed the work to be halted on the ground that the contracts were let without competitive bids in violation of the law. Boynton said the work is about 60% completed and his lawyers have advised him the contracts are legal. He said he took the contracts on a cost-plus basis. Boynton's contracts are at state asylums, and if bids have had been asked, they would have been high to protect against damage done by, demanded per, by demented persons, he declared. Boynton said he has never been involved in politics. He has been a general contractor in Chicago for 20 years and has done little work for any public body. Several of his friends supported John Stellan in his campaign for the Democratic gubernatorial nomination last spring, uh, Boynton said. Jefferson City, Missouri, January 25th. The Missouri Supreme Court tonight issued a preliminary writ which temporarily blocked a recount of votes by a Democratic-controlled legislative committee investigating the election of a governor last November 5th. The action was taken on a suit brought by Forrest C. Dono, Republican, who won the election by 3,613 votes in in official returns. 
The court set January 30th as the deadline for returns from lawyers for both sides, thus rushing the case towards an early decision on its merits. Dono had sought a writ of pro- prohibition to prevent the vote recount, charging that the committee has no legal status and that its proceedings were void. The legislative contest of Donald's election over Lawrence McDaniel, St. Louis Democrat, has kept Donald from taking office. He also has, pending before the court, which is made up of seven Democrats, another suit seeking to compel Morris E. Osborne, Speaker of the State House of Representatives, to declare him governor on the face of the returns. Donald filed today's suit personally and sat through an informal hearing before six of the seven judges. Chief Justice C.A. Leedy Jr. said the decision meant that the court accepted jurisdiction in the case. Attorney General Roy McKittrick, representing the Committee of Legislators, sought to stop issuance of the preliminary order, but their arguments were overruled by the decision. Milwaukee, Wisconsin, January 25th. A demand for full payment for time lost in their strike at the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing Company plant was made today by the CIO United Automobile Workers Union. Harold Christoffel, president of the local, said the company forced the strike and that, in addition to settlement of other demands, a return to work would be contingent upon payment for lost time. Two AFL unions engaged in maintenance reported for duty at the factory today. Their business agent said they would continue to refuse to sign agreements not to participate in AFL AFL organizing activity. The strike leaders had demanded such waivers in return for passes into the plant. The federal government stepped up the tempo of its efforts to settle the strike today by sending Thomas F. Burns here from Washington to aid Messenger Francis Haas and Major James P. Holmes, Labor Department uh, conciliators already on the scene. Burns represents Sidney Hillman, Associate Director of the Office of Production Management for National Defense. It was learned from company officials that the government was vitally interested in strike si- in the strike situation here because of the previously announced $26 million in additional defense orders and an additional $14 million for defense equipment waiting to be started. Police from the Central Station and the Morals Division yesterday raided 11 alleged handbooks in the loop and arrested 25 men. The prisoners were charged with disorderly conduct and will be arraigned in South State Street Court tomorrow. East St. Louis, Illinois, January 25th. A coroner's jury today recommended that Mrs. Lou Burns, blonde widow of Phil, four ill-fated marriages be held to the grand jury without bail on the charge of murder and the gunslaying of her last husband. John Burns, 45, locally prominent jeweler, was fatally shot last evening in the living room of their home in an after-dinner argument over his wife's purchase of a dress. He was her second mate to die in that manner, his predecessor having succumbed to bullets about 10 years ago. Mrs. Burns, a tall blonde of 38, did not testify at the inquest. Neither did her son by a former marriage, Gene Rodimich, age 21, a law student at St. Louis University, although he had told police that Burns was the second stepfather he had seen his mother shoot to death. Gas company officials said yesterday they had found evidence that tampering with the gas system had caused the explosion which demolished a five-room cottage at 2444 West 83rd Street Friday night. Walter J. Wendy, 34 years old, the owner of the home, was being questioned in the Chicago Lawn Police Station concerning the explosion. He denied he had tampered in any way with the gas system in the home which was heated with a gas furnace. J.A. Cunningham, secretary of the People's Gas Light and Coke Company, said, We had a guard over the house all night and investigation this morning disclosed that a jumper had been installed to bypass the gas meter and that there had been tampering with the installation, which undoubtedly resulted in a leak and caused the explosion. Wendy, a city fireman attached to Rescue Squad 9, and his wife, Marie, 34, and their son, Walter Jr., six months old, were not at home at the time of the explosion. Stanley Budnick, 45 years old, delivered some cordials in the 2100 block of Northwestern Avenue last night. When he stepped back into his truck, a bandit stepped uh, stepped in behind him. 
This, the bandit began waving a 25 caliber automatic pistol, but he accidentally pulled the trigger and shot off his left index finger. This, the bandit went on, flinching a little, is a stick-up. He forced Budnick, who lives at 2308 North Hoyne Avenue, to drive two blocks to a secluded spot. There, the, the bandit robbed Budnick of $160. The gunman fled, calling back, it doesn't hurt much. Ann Arbor, Michigan, January 25th. Truman C. Nelson, 35 years old, a well-known Ann Arbor real estate agent, was charged in a warrant issued today with swindling Fred Morley, 85-year-old retired engineer, out of $15,450. Prosecutor George Meter said Nelson confessed obtaining the money in six transactions involving non-existent mortgages, which he pretended to have bought and held in trust for Morley. Abraham Levy, 61, an employee of Nelson, also was detained and questioned. Nelson, who has operated the Nelson Realty Company here for 15 years, was said by Prosecutor Meter to have obtained Morley's confidence by hand handling a transaction involving a legitimate $1,200 mortgage. The next six tr transactions, however, according to Nelson's signed confession, involved non-existent notes and mortgages and fictitious persons. Nelson convinced Morley to let him hold the mortgages for safekeeping, giving him receipts instead, and then misled him by making support, uh, supposed mortgage payments. Nelson was arrested as a result of questioning during an investigation of an attack upon Morley, which Nelson witnesses by an intruder who slipped into Morley's house Thursday night. Morley was struck twice over the head, apparently with a hammer, but the assailant escaped. Morley's injuries were not considered serious. Mor Morley told police he called Nelson to his home to make an accounting of $2,700 owed him in mortgage payments. When asked by detectives Eugene I. Geringer and Albert E. Husel why he had not turned the mortgages over to Morley, Nelson said, I might as well be frank with you, there aren't any. The policeman said Morley had not been suspicious that he had been swindled, but was dissatisfied with Nelson's delay in turning over the payments. Two bandits robbed E.F. Scully, 4701 Armitage Avenue, of his new automobile and $47 early yesterday, then used the car in four other northwest side robberies, which netted the pair $78.75 more. The men, both armed, forced their way into Scully's automobile at Lincoln and Foster Avenues. Within the next hour, they held up filling stations at 2847 Chicago Avenue, 2814 Irving Park Road, and 1401 Augusta Boulevard, and robbed Michael Nazanek near his home at 849 North Levitt Street. Four persons who were injured when a giant skyrocket exploded against their automobile last July 4th filed suit in Superior Court yesterday for $50,000 against the Argo Summit American Legion Post number 735 and the Liberty Display Fireworks Company of Franklin Park. The four who were watching a fireworks display at 56th Street and Harlem Avenue are Mr. and Mrs. Roy Fordish of 4910 Erie Street and Mr. and Mrs. Daryl Epperson of 7350 Harlem Avenue. Four small children left motherless by a hit-and-run driver wept yesterday at the inquest into the death of Mrs. Teresa, Teresa Mathes, their father Philip, a construction foreman tried in vain to comfort them. Mrs. Methies, who was 32 years old, was struck down Friday night near her home at 7222 Morgan Street. Her daughter, Angeline, 12, described the accident at the inquest in the undertaking chapel at 7030 South Halstead Street. Police were hopeful that they might trace the motorist through the rim of a headlight they found on the scene. They said they also had the first three digits of the license number and the make of the car. Marengo, Illinois, January 25th. Carl R. Scherf, 15 years old, was accidentally shot to death today with a 16-gauge shotgun in the hands of a friend. The boys were shooting pigeons. Two four-car articulated streamlined trains are being scheduled to be placed in service February 9th between Chicago and Milwaukee by the Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Railroad officials of the electric line disclosed yesterday. The trains have been named Electroliners and it is said they are the most luxurious electric interurban trains in the country. 
Delivery of one of the trains has been made and the other is expected to arrive in Chicago shortly from the shops of the builders, the St. Louis Car Company. The new trains are scheduled to make five trips each way daily between Chicago and Milwaukee, running via the Skokie Valley route. DuPage County, the first Illinois county to adopt zoning, is entering its sixth year under the ordinance with many lessons learned and an ambitious program of better of betterments outlined for 1941 and thereafter. John McPrice of Hinsdale, chairman of the DuPage County Board of Appeals, who yesterday made public a five-year report, said several improvements in the zoning law, which have been adopted by by other Illinois counties, may soon be incorporated in DuPage County uh, in the DuPage County plan adopted in December 1935. Among these items are one, the location of billboards; two, the location of trailer camps; three, specific rules set up to guide the Board of Appeals in making variations; four, expansion of non-conforming uses permitted if in farming district only with certain special restrictions. And five, special regulations with respect to water and sewers. And in sports, Northwestern juggled its basketball lineup last night and by the series of moves achieved its first Western Conference victory of the season by whipping Michigan and Evanston High School Gymnasium 45-34. The issue was determined midway in the first half when the Wildcats gained a 20-9 lead. Thereafter, they maintained that approximate advantage over the visitors who only last Monday had achieved their initial Big Ten triumph at the expense of Minnesota. In a surprise lineup maneuver, Coach Dutch Lonborg benched Burley Don Kloss in center and George Benson guard. Captain Al Bathurus was sent to forward from the backcourt to pair with Henry Klassen. Sophomore Clarence Hasse replaced Clawson and Bob McCarns, a infrequent substitute this season, started at guard with the reliable Russ Wendland. Principal improvements with due allowance for Michigan's sketchy defense in the first period were better long-distance shooting, improved drive with drive with Batheris handling the ball, and a defense that completely checked Michigan's Jim Mandler from the field until only four minutes of the game remained. Michigan, as usual, suffered from lack of height. Moreover, the flashy dribbling of Mike Sofiak seldom penetrated the Wildcats' defenses. Except for an occasional quick break, Michigan depended on set shots and only Herb Brogan had much luck with these in the opening half. Michigan led 3-0 and again 7-6. Northwestern's first and second field goals by Klassen and McCarns, respectively, were scored from under the backboard after perfect block plays with the scorers dribbling to the outside and into the board. Klassen's side shot and successive field goals by Hasse and McCarns gave the Wildcats a 10-7 lead before George Rule batted in a follow-up goal. Ten minutes had been played. In the next seven minutes, Michigan did not score. The Wildcats got five field goals, three from under the basket, and the sharp short passes of Hasse and Betheris, who fed the ball, punctured Michigan's defense. With the count 20-9, Brogan dropped in a long goal as third of the period. Matching scoring, the teams reached the intermission with Northwestern ahead 23-14. Early in the second period, Michigan cut the margin to 27-21, but long shots by Wendland and McCarns and Klassen's goal on Hasse's pass made the count 33-21. Thereafter, the Wolverines never were nearer than eight points, and when the Wildcats led 43-31 with four minutes to play, they finished content to keep possession. Notre Dame, Indiana, January 25th. Charlie Butler, substituting for injured Captain Eddie Riska tonight, became Notre Dame's newest basketball hero as his 17 points paced the Irish to a 46-39 victory over Michigan State before 5,000. It was Notre Dame's sixth straight victory, and it snapped the Spartans' six-game winning streak. Butler used his 155 pounds effectively to get 10 points in the first half to give the Irish a 22-17 lead. He made six more in the second period, playing 37 minutes of the contest. Notre Dame took a quick lead when Butler sank a field goal and added a free throw on McCoola's foul in the first 30 seconds. McCoola's push shot shot and Phillips' free throw tied the score. 
Phillips and Sobek exchanged free throws, but Notre Dame drew ahead on Bob Smith's set shot to stay in front. With Notre Dame leading 32-24 midway in the second half, Hindman made six points to lead a rally, which cut the score to 36-33. But here, Cy Singer, Irish sophomore guard, led a closing rally with six points. Madison, Wisconsin, January 25th. Before a crowd of 13,300, largest ever to attend a basketball game in the University Fieldhouse, Wisconsin dealt Ohio State its first conference defeat of the season tonight, 46-31. to The victory moved the Badgers into second place behind Indiana in the Big Ten standing. Off to a poor start, Wisconsin once scoreless for the first nine and one half minutes, then moved into a 16 to 15 lead at the half and gradually widened the margin in the last 15 minutes. Gene England, Wisconsin center, poured in six field goals and four free throws to raise his total to 77 in conference contests before leaving the game late in the second period. Sophomore forwards John Cotts and Ray Lanch- Lanheiser. Both from Rhinelander, Wisconsin, gave England excellent support in the scoring column with 12 and 8 points respectively. Ohio State lost both of its first and second scoring centers, Jack McLean and Roger Jorgensen, on personal fouls in the second half, but the Badgers' attack then was functioning smoothly. While Ohio State's starting forwards were held to a basket apiece, Fred Miller found the range for 16 points to lead the Buckeye attack. The teams battled on even terms during the early part of the second half, with Ohio once taking a momentary 17-16 lead and the latter tying the score at 19-19 before the Badgers began pulling away. The previous fieldhouse attendance record of 13,003 was set in the 1938 Purdue game. After leading at the half, the University of Chicago's basketball team succumbed to DePaul 37-32 before 3,000 in the Midway Fieldhouse last night. It was DePaul's 10th victory against three defeats and the Maroons' 6th loss of the season. Bob Wozni, DePaul forward, led the scoring with four field goals and a pair of free throws for 10 points, one more than Captain Joe Stamps turned in for Chicago. DePaul scored first on a field goal by Carter O'Rourke and Elmer Gaynor. Wozni and O'Rourke took the Demons to a 6-1 lead before the Maroons got started. Then Chuck Wagenberg and George Krakawa sparked the Maroons in a rally. A basket by Fonz and a one-handed shot by Stamp tied the game at 15 apiece, and Edgar Nelson's field goal from the sidelines put the Maroons ahead. Free throws by Jim Crosby and Wagenberg balanced a short field goal by Edwin Sachs for DePaul, and the Maroons led at the half 19-17. Wozni's basket tied the score to start the second half, but Nelson returned the Maroons to the lead. Then Wexler scored from the side, and Ed Bodansky sank a long shot after five minutes over the period to give DePaul a lead it never relinquished. Wozni's two baskets, a goal and a free throw by O'Rourke and Wexler's free throw, while the Maroons were making only two points, gave DePaul an eight-point lead midway in the half, their largest margin of the contest. The Chicago Bruins, seeking their sixth victory and a tie with the Detroit Eagles for fourth place in the National Basketball League standings, meet the Hammond Pros in the Hammond Civic Center today. It will be the Bruins' first league game since they defeated the league-leading Oshkosh All-Stars 34-32 in the 132nd field or a regiment armory Wednesday. Hammond, though in last place, is one of the most powerful scoring units in the National League. On the Bruins' last visit to Hammond, the Indiana 5 won 41-33 when Ralph Vaughn scored 19 points. That defeat was avenged a few days later in Chicago when the Bruins triumphed 50-46 with Wibbs Couts of the Chicago Quintet tying the league individual scoring mark of 21 points. The Blackhawks, who climbed into fourth place by defeating the New York Americans Thursday, will battle the other New York team tonight. The Hawks, in four games against the world champion Rangers this season, have won three and tied one. In Chicago, the scores were 4-1 and 3-1. In New York, 3-3 and 3-2. The Rangers showing to date this season is, in some respects, like the play of the Blackhawks in 1938-39 when they were world champions. After winning the Skit Stanley Cup, the Hawks went out during the summer and purchased Northcott, Blinko, 
and Robinson, an entire line looked upon at that time as one of the best in the league. However, the end of the season saw the world champions at the bottom of the league. Hockey experts and fans alike expect the Rangers to get started soon. When and if they do, they can ascend the ladder rapidly, for despite their shortcomings to date, they are only three and a half games from second place. The club is made up entirely of the players who established the record of 19 games without a loss and won the championship. Toronto, Ontario, January 25th. The Montreal Canadiens gained their first point of the season at the expense of the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight before 11,843 when they held the National Hockey League leaders to a 2-2 overtime tie. In five previous starts, the Leafs, the Leafs were victorious each time. The Canadians took a two-goal lead in the first period, but the Leafs evened it up in the second. The Leafs increased their lead to five points over the Detroit Red Wings. The Canadians moved within three points of the fifth-place New York Rangers. The Cubs' two gyms, Gallagher and Wilson, each day appear to be more likely to suffer recurrent pains in the neck as a result of the maneuvers of the Cubs' two rookie lose. Novikov and Stringer, $150,000 worth of eccentric ivory purchased from the Los Angeles Angels. Yesterday, a week of anxiety over Novikov was climaxed by word from Los Angeles that the two lose want more salary than has been offered them to date. This desire in itself is no symptom of insanity or even uh, perverseness, of course, but the method of, of procedure has taken on some elements of screwiness. In the first place, both Novikov and Stringer have had their contracts for almost a month. According to Cub officials, neither has returned his contract unsigned or communicated with the home office in any way. Last Monday, Novikov, the highly and perhaps over-publicized slugger, reputed to have cost the Cubs $100,000, confided to West Coast friends, but not to the Cubs' management, that his cupboard was bare. He said that he would have to go to work to feed his wife and children until the start of the baseball season. He picked out one of the most hazardous jobs attainable, that of an oil well, oil well driller. Novikov would have liked a job in Hollywood as a stuntman, but the fellows who jump off cliffs and drive automobiles in the brick walls have a union and wouldn't initiate Lou. He also is a harmonica player and a strip teaser, but these a strip teaser, but, but these fields, though also dangerous, a dangerous strip teaser, though, though also dangerous, are overcrowded. Shortly after last season ended, Novikov intimated to Cub representatives that he felt a stringency of of scratch coming on and at, and if it would be all right for him to play some winter baseball. It was pointed out that major league contracts forbid such activity, but it also was intimated that the Cubs might waive the rule in Novikov's case. Or it was suggested at that time the Cubs would stand for a light touch or bite in the form of an advance on salary. Major League players this year will have their first payday on May 1st. Nothing more has been heard direct from Novikov about anything. Salary dissatisfaction, winter baseball, uh, hard or soft, any uh, advance in pay or harmonica playing. The, the uh, Cub office early in December did not receive a set of photographs showing Lou doing a strip tease, but these were submitted purely as our... I'm sorry, the Cub office early in December did receive a set of photographs showing Lou doing his strip tease, but these were submitted purely as artistic exhibits. Up till yesterday, there had been no concern about Stringer other than sly suggestions that he was a born second baseman and it would be a horrible mistake to play him anyplace else. For a time, there was some anxiety about his draft status and as much as he is unmarried, but this worry was eased when the young man came up with some dependence. It is known that Novikov has an agent or personal advisor after the best Hollywood and California practice. In yesterday's dispatches from Los Angeles, there was some evidence that this agent, a man named Rogers, also may be representing uh, Stringer. And in any event, Stringer was reported to be talking for both Novikov and himself, saying, We don't want to get off on the wrong foot with the Cubs front office. That is, we do not want to be considered as fresh upstarts or unappreciative kids, but we feel we are entitled to a larger salary than we have been offered. 
If an agent or agents are representing Novikov and Stringer on a percentage basis, the situation may attract the attention of Commissioner K.M. Landis. A couple of seasons ago, Commissioner Landis learned that Joe DiMaggio had an agent and stepped on the Hollywood technique. In connection with Stringer's statement, it was said that both he and Novikov had returned unsigned contracts. Both general manager James T. Gallagher, who had been out of the city for a couple of days, and treasurer Bill Veck Jr. gave their desks a special frisk after hearing about the goings-on in Southern California. They could find no return contracts from the two native Los Angelinos or anybody else. Des Moines, Iowa, January 25th. Whatever the amount Bob Feller will draw in 1941 from the Cleveland Indians, the Iowa farm boy won't disclose the figure. In fact, Bob said today he was surprised to find himself in the center of a discussion between the Detroit Tigers and Cleveland whether he or Buck Newsom is going to be the highest paid pitcher this year. If the Cleveland club wants to publicize my salary, it's agreeable to me, said Bob, but their policy always has been not to divulge the contract figures of any players. San Francisco, California, January 25th. The Cincinnati Reds were beset by contract trouble in this area today. Eddie Juice, utility infielder who is slated to become the regular shortstop, joined catcher Ernie Lombardi in the We Want More Money class. Lombardi rejected his second contract, requesting restoration of a $6,000 cut. Juice said he had expected more than a $2,000 increase. Cleveland, Ohio, January 25th. Judge Frank J. Lausch offered a desertion on baseball and tomatoes today in dismissing assault and battery charges against George Bertie Tebbets, Detroit catcher who swung on a grandstand pit pitcher in the vegetable bombardment at a Cleveland-Detroit game here September 27th. It's in interesting nowadays that spectators carry brick bats in the form of sneers and jeers, the judge remarked. When these sneers and jeers become implemented with the projecting of overripe tomatoes, confusion is sure to result. I suppose sometimes it's more than youthful, play than youthful players can stand. Baseballs and not tomatoes should be caught by ballplayers. I believe Tebbets caught everything thrown to him in 1940 but that basket of tomatoes. If he had not manifested some emotion after to the tomatoes, he would, have to, he would have to have a coolness of blood that is not expected of anyone. The 26-year-old Detroit player was struck in the head by the basket tossed from the upper grandstand while he was sitting in Detroit's bullpen with pitcher schoolboy Rowe. The assault charges were brought by Carmen Guerra, 27 years old, a fan convicted of disorderly conduct for throwing tomatoes. Guerra also has a pending $5,000 damage suit against Tebbets. Guerra testified Tebbets struck him three or four times in the face as policemen were escorting him from the, from the stands. He added that a policeman held his hands while the Detroit catcher hit him. I started a left, but it never landed, the player declared. I never hit the boy. Al Benton, Detroit pitcher, and several policemen grabbed him at this point, Tebbets testified. I was plenty dazed by that blow on the head, he continued. Why, I cried like a baby in the clubhouse. Sergeant John J. Caterba said he stopped Tebbets' blow by sticking out his hand. Caterba said his hand was still swollen after four months. New York, January 25th. Babe Ruth, confined to his home for a week with influenza, was reported improving steadily today. However, the former home run champion will have to remain in bed a few more days, his physician said. Ruth is expected to attend the New York Baseball Writers' annual dinner Sunday night. New York, January 25th. They're serving Clarence Red Berman up in Madison Square Garden Friday night for Joe Lewis's 13th defense of his World Heavyweight Championship with all indications that the Friday jinx will prove unlucky to Red. If courage and confidence alone could beat Lewis, the Baltimore Redhead undoubtedly would knock the bomber right out from under his crown. But as several fellows who try to can testify, just Hart alone isn't going to turn a trick, and Red doesn't seem to have the necessary big guns and armor plate to go with it. He has speed, a solid left hook to the body, and a half-crouching weaving style that may baffle Joe for a while. Sooner or later, however, Lewis figures to catch up with him. Making his first start in 1941, Lewis goes to the post for the second time in his fight in a, in his fight in a month campaign, which began when he knocked out Al McCoy in Boston in December. 
From here, Joe goes to Philadelphia to tangle with Gus Dorazio February 17th, to Detroit for a bout with Abe Simon in March, and to Los Angeles for his third match with Arturo Godoy in April. Berman has been ranked among the first five heavyweights for the last two years ever since he gave Tommy Farr a going over. Later, he dropped a return decision to Tommy in London, but on this side of the Atlantic, he hasn't lost a fight in four years. Starting with 1938, he has won 17 straight in this country. It's going to be uh, too bad to break a string like that, which is what figures to happen unless Lewis is much worse than he was in his somewhat dismal showing against McCoy last month. And that is sports, and that is the news. Henry Chop reporting for January 26th, 1941. Have a swell day.